Your first speaker today will be Amit Geffen. Amit received his Bachelor in Science in Mechanical Engineering and his Master's in Science and PhD in Biomechanical Engineering from Tel Aviv University. He currently is a full professor with the Department of Biomedical Engineering of Tel Aviv University. His research interests are in studying normal and pathological effects of biomechanical forces on the structure and function of cells, tissue, and organs, with emphasis on applications in chronic wound research. He will be followed by Laura Rice. Laura Rice is an associate professor in the Department of Kinesiology and Community Health at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Her research focuses on management of secondary impairments associated with physical disabilities. In addition, Dr. Rice also sees clients for wheelchair and seating needs. She received her PhD in Rehabilitation Science and Technology from the University of Pittsburgh in 2010 and her Master's in Science in Physical Therapy from Duquesne University in 2004. The third speaker will be Ben Mortensen. Ben Mortensen is an associate professor at the University of British Columbia. His research focuses on four overlapping areas, assistive technology, social participation, caregiving and outcome measurements. His work is centered on four main populations, assistive technology users, informal and formal caregivers, individuals with spinal cord injuries, and residents in long-term care. His chief concern is to enable a societal participation of individuals with varying levels of abilities. He's a co-developer of the wheelchair outcome measure. Your last presenter will be Michael Banks. Michael Banks received his degree in biomechanical science from the University of California and California State University Fullerton before entering the healthcare field 29 years ago. He's a past presenter at the International Seating Symposium and is attracted towards technology that enables quantification of the principles and practices encountered in the field of seating and wheeled mobility. Enjoy. Thank you very much for this nice introduction, Vanessa. What I'd like to speak about, why should the design and the prescription of cushions consider that the body is continuously changing. We, actually policymakers in particular, tend to think that a cushion is no longer effective once it's aged, wear and tear. But it's much more complicated than that because the body is changing together with the cushion. And uh, as I'll show you today, actually the body sometimes changes much faster than the cushion. And the cushion need to respond. I assume that you all know what pressure ulcers are. And I assume that you know that they are categorized um, from in severity levels, from changes in skin to deep tissue loss. And we know for the last 10 years or so that most of these category four severe pressure ulcers actually started as a deep tissue injury. So they started internally and damage has spreaded outwards until it reached near the skin or to the skin, and then the skin broke down, and then you get these crater-like um, wounds, which are basically penetrated wounds. And you know that there are different populations who are susceptible to these, to these injuries. The elderly are referred to a lot, but we should also think about younger patients uh, for example, those with a spinal cord injury, who need to spend decades um, in a chair and for whom we need to consider better protection, especially against these devastating deep tissue injuries, which are, until recently, were classified as category four or stage four or grade four pressure ulcers, but now 
um, after um, half a year ago, we, the EPUAP, the European Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel, together with the American sister organization, the NPUAP, and the Pan-Pacific Alliance have launched our guidelines. We are now recognizing deep tissue injuries um, internationally as one of the categories in the classification system. And this is just another evidence that we now better understand the etiology of these serious pressure ulcers, which are affecting different types of populations, as I've mentioned, including pediatric patients. In my lab, we have been looking at the etiology of deep tissue injury for the last 10 or 15 years. And what we um, know uh, from basic mechanical engineering principles is that what you have here is something like a rigid and dental, which is the bone, that is deforming and distorting layers of soft tissues. And the first element that is interfacing the rigid bone during sitting is muscle tissue, the gluteus muscles. And since these cells at the contact site between the bone and the muscle are so distorted as a result of the body weight being transferred through the ischial tuberosities, at some point these cells die. And then damage spreads and spreads and you have what we call necrosis, apoptosis, um, cascade or feedback loop. And at some point, someone is going to see some, something uh, on the skin, like spots, purple spots, blue spots, black spots. That's too late. And in many cases, the tissues will just break down, the skin will break down, and then you'll get these types of deep wounds. And that's what we want to prevent, essentially. These are the more serious wounds. Um, and they're, they're tricky to detect, they're tricky to identify. We have been doing a lot of basic research to understand how these wounds are forming and how they progress. We've developed methods of quantification based on imaging, mostly MRI, to look at how tissues deform under the body weight in sitting positions. We've coupled that with computational modeling to quantify these localized uh, mechanical loads just under the bone. As you can see here, you can see how much the muscle is, defor is deforming and you can see that in the MRI image, but what you can't see is what's happening directly under the bone in these just few cells that will die first because they are the most deformed ones. Like what would happen if you will just take a sharp element like a pen and push it against the soft foam and at the contact site between the tip of the pen and the soft foam, you'll have so much deformation. This is what the cells are experiencing and they will die. And then we started to think about, okay, but why they're dying? Is it because of lack of blood flow, impaired perfusion? Maybe it's because the lymphatic system is not functioning well. Maybe it's just that the cells are squashed. So we've developed living model systems that can isolate these different effects. For example, tissue engineered muscles that are, con that are um, formed from myoblasts, from muscle cells, without any blood vessels. So there can't be any ischemia and you can look at the isolated effect of tissue deformations on these constructs. We've looked at the effect of deformation on individual cells that are being stretched or deformed, much like what these cells here would sense. And what we found basically is that deformation itself is the driving mechanism, is the most important factor that eventually kills the cells. And it does it by affecting the subcellular structures, the microstructures in the cells, for example, the integrity of the cell wall, which is being damaged. Um, there are micropores that develop in the um, walls of the uh, cells, the plasma membranes of the cells, and that interferes with normal transport of substances uh, throughout the uh, cell walls. And cells eventually lose, lose homeostasis. 
they lose their biological equilibrium, and they die. And that happens much faster than any effect that ischemia can um, induce. And that's basically changing the textbooks now. And um, again, in the guidelines, uh, the pressure ulcer prevention guidelines that we launched, in the etiology chapter, we now recognize this effect of deformation as being the primary factor that um, produces pressure ulcers. And that's interesting because some of the industry are still looking at these, and clinicians as well, are still looking at these pressure maps as a measure, as a ruler of how much risk there is for the individual, for the tissues. And to me, it always sounded like this old Indian tale about these three blind men who are trying to guess what an elephant is by just trying to feel it. You don't get anything, any relevant information about internal tissue loading, internal tissue deformations from just looking at the surface. In order to know what would be the risk of deep tissues for breakdown, like what we see in deep tissue injuries, you need to look internally. And I'm going to this sitting symposia like this one, and I'm overwhelmed with the variety of support surfaces, wheelchair cushions, mattresses, and the different technologies. To me as an engineer, so many solutions imply that we don't really understand the problem. But I'm thinking that we are getting it together. We are um, achieving this understanding of what drives pressure ulcers. And what you really need to minimize if you want to have an effective support surface is tissue deformations, internal tissue deformations. In order to look at the efficacy of support surfaces in minimizing internal tissue deformations, we can use imaging like I've shown you before, MRI, and we can also couple that with computational modeling. Computational modeling allows us to map these internal tissue loads and to look at how different support surfaces are performing to minimize internal tissue loads. We've partnered with Rojo um, four years ago to simulate their air cell based cushion using the state-of-the-art computational tools and to develop models that will take into account the complex uh, pattern of collapse of the air cells as someone is immersed into the cushion and how the cushion envelopes that person and how tissues are deformed when this interaction takes place. We've then looked at long-term changes in the body as I've mentioned, because the body is continuously changing. If you think about spinal cord injuries, you, think you, you need to consider that the body will undergo major changes such as muscle atrophy, changes to the contours of the bone, what we call bone adaptation. Pressure ulcers can form and close and they leave scars and that changes the skin and the subcutaneous tissues and maybe the deep tissues as well. And all of this can be considered in the simulations. We managed to develop models that take all of this into account and to compare different technologies, for example, air cell based versus foam, versus foam cushions. And what we find is that with air cells, you can achieve immersion and envelopment to an extent which is not possible to achieve using forms. You can see that in the simulations. This level of immersion and envelopment that these uh, air cell based cushions are producing minimizes these internal tissue deformations at the interface between the bones and the soft tissues. It minimizes them so much that we found a 10,000 times difference, a, ten, a factor of 10,000 times difference in tissue deformations between uh, what's happening in forms, on forms, and what's happening on air cell based. 
So if you increase the inertia and envelopment by, say, a factor of 1.5, uh, which you can do with SL-based cushions, you can reduce internal tissue loading by a factor of 10,000, yeah, order of magnitude. This all comes from basic biomechanical principles of what we call stress concentration effects. The interaction between the bone and the soft tissue is a stress concentration effect. And this stress concentration effect is so sensitive to the pattern by which forces are transferred from the external environment, from the contact between the cushion and the body, so that once you maximize this envelopment, you can reduce these um, uh, internal uh, tissue deformations to, to, to an extent that could, we could not even fit the same, uh, the, 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 the data into, into the same scale, so we had to break the scale. So that's, that's really impressive. The other thing is that when you take these long-term tissue changes into account, such as bone adaptation, muscle, ad muscle atrophy, combination of them, maybe even spasms, for which this S is standing for, you can see that on a foam cushion, the levels of tissue deformations tend to increase as these changes, pathoanatomical changes in the body develop after a spinal cord injury. You don't see that on an aerosol-based cushion, and that's because the effect of immersion and envelopment is protecting these tissues so that it counteracts these changes as well. You can take scars into account, and you can look at different types and shapes of scars, like hourglass scars, and look at the risk for tissue breakdown as a result of the presence of these stiff scars. Because these stiff scars will again be a stress concentration factor. They, they, they're quite rigid, they can't deform, and something needs to deform. So what will be deforming is the soft tissues around them, and these tissues eventually tear, which is why you see so much reoccurrence of pressure ulcers in uh, people who had a history of pressure ulcers. And then the questions come if these aerosol-based technologies are effective enough to protect the tissues even when there is a history of tissue damage. And we see that in most cases, you can actually protect the tissues even if there's damage or a history of damage that was present there. Clinicians know that uh, they often prescribe um, aerosol-based cushions to people who, ha who currently have a pressure ulcer or who had a history of pressure ulcers, but we now have the evidence uh, for why that's effective. We've just published this in the latest issue of the Journal of Rehab, Rehab, um, uh, Rehabilitation Research and Development. So I hope that, by, uh, that at this time I convince you that immersion and envelopment is important. There are different ways, though, to achieve immersion and envelopment. One of them would be to essentially fit a contour foam cushion, which theoretically would achieve as well um, 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 a high immersion and envelopment as well. But then I'm going back to the title of my talk. Think about these body changes that take place, and they take place so fast um, in a spinal cord injury. They tend to lose after 20, 30 weeks. They tend to lose as much as 40 percent of the bone and muscle tissue in the buttocks as a result of disuse, atrophy-related changes. Now, if you fit a contoured foam cushion, it minimizes tissue deformations perfectly. So you see, it's all blue. Blue is good. No localized stress concentrations. But what happens if that patient now gains weight, for example, and doesn't fit in the holes of the cushion anymore? And that happens with spinal cord injury patients. Well, they tend to gain weight because they're less active. Now, this little step in the contour is constraining the skin. The skin can't move as effectively anymore. Something needs to move. And what moves is the internal tissues, which are sliding against each other. The muscle and the fat are sliding against each other as the buttocks is trying to sink into the cushion. And that creates internal shear, which will promote the risk for tissue, for tissue injury for a deep tissue injury. If you think about other changes that take place there, like fat infiltration into the muscle, which makes the muscle softer, but also cause muscle tissue to slide 
internally, so muscle pieces are basically sliding against each other where there is interfacing fat in between them, and that increases this internal shear even further. So that, imp that basically imposes risk on that patient who thinks that he's now protected after some weeks from the time of fitting of the cushion. Just think about that when you think about reimbursement policies here in the United States, which allow you to change a cushion every five years or so. It used to be three years, now it's pushed to five years. And think about the fact that if you had cells in the tissues that were exposed to tolerable level at the time of fitting of the cushion, after some weeks, half a year max, this level of tissue deformations, of cell deformations is tripled and the patient is not protected anymore. So I'm wrapping up by saying that the key characteristics are immersion and envelopment, energy stability to minimize internal tissue deformations. And that's really the key for safe sitting. I'd like to thank, first of all, my grad students who did this, um, the work, the MRI studies and the simulations, and the support that we get from um, Rojo, the funding, as well as the professional advice um, that we're getting regarding feedback about um, the uh, cushion industry uh, from Rojo. And thank you for listening. And uh, I'll be happy to take questions. I was just wanting to know if we can get your, uh, like, the notes from you. Sorry? The, the presentation, like, are you able, are oh, we I able to? Oh, okay. Uh, some people have been giving us their email addresses if it's not already been on there. So, thank you. Please don't give me that address. All right, thank you. Uh, good morning, thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Laura Rice. I am gonna be talking about a systematic review that was recently uh, performed on the assessment and management of fall risk among non-ambulatory adults. Um, so just a little bit about what we'll be doing today. Uh, first of all, I have no conflicts uh, to report. I don't work with any manufacturers. Um, so we're gonna be ta uh, starting off by talking about the impact of falls and why it is such an important topic for uh, non-ambulatory individuals or wheelchair users. Um, and then we are gonna be talking about some of the literature review uh, details, and then finally discuss the risk factors that I found uh, to be associated with falls. Uh, the primary topics that we're gonna be discussing are the impact of the wheelchair design, uh, transfers, balance, and then the environment. Um, and I have included the reference here um, for the full paper. I'm um, only gonna be talking about a small portion of it today, uh, but if you're interested in the rest of the findings of the systematic review, I've provided the reference for you here. Okay, um, so why do we care about falls and why are they so important? Um, so first of all, depending on uh, wh what data you look at, um, there are millions of wheelchair users in the United States, about three million. Um, but most importantly, that number is, supposed, is uh, expected to increase on a yearly basis, about 5%. Um, so we have a lot of uh, people who are wheelchair users. Um, and unfortunately though, what the research shows us is that between 30 to 60% of these individuals are falling at least one time per six months. Um, and there are about 100,000 um, wheelchair related accidents per year. Um, and many of those are related to falls. And unfortunately, approximately 68% of fatal wheelchair accidents are related to falls as well. Um, so it's really a significant problem that uh, wheelchair users are facing. Uh, so what can happen when a person falls? So obviously we think of the very um, basic things and the obvious things, uh, people can get um, bruises or scrapes, um, which may seem like a very minor thing, but for an individual who maybe has um, impaired sensation, 
uh, that actually can uh, lead to more significant things like infection or the development of crush or ulcers. Uh, more significantly, falls can lead to fractures. Uh, we all know the data related to hip fractures, especially in elderly individuals and how detrimental that can be. Um, also things like concussions, traumatic brain injury, um, or a spinal cord injury can result. And then also there is an increase in hospital admissions um, and long-term care admissions as well. Another aspect of falling that we often don't think about though um, is the psychological impact. And I actually, this is a, an area that I'm very interested in research-wise. Um, so if a person falls or even if they have kind of a close, um, close call where they may have stumbled but not actually fallen, um, oftentimes people develop a really intense fear of falling. And this leads to a really um, intense disuse disability cycle um, where because they're afraid to fall, um, they stop doing things. They don't want to get out of their chairs or maybe they don't even want to get out of bed. Um, so they limit their activities. Um, that leads to an inability to fulfill their social roles that they need to perform. Um, also can impact their independence. Uh, they may need more assistance to perform um, daily activities. Um, also, if they're not getting up and, and doing things, um, there is a physiological de deconditioning that occurs. And this weakness and uh, loss of function can impact their ability to perform their activities of daily living. So it's really this vicious cycle that we get into and then they're more likely to fall because they're weaker and so on. Um, so it, it has a very large impact on um, the psycho psychological aspect of an individual as well. Um, so where, where are we at at the current state of fall research? Um, unfortunately, the majority of the research is focused on ambulatory individuals. Um, so we have tons and tons of studies out there on elderly individuals who are falling and why they're falling, and then also in special populations, particularly MS. A lot of my colleagues at the University of Illinois uh, do quite a bit of research on falls in MS. Um, and my, at least in my opinion, um, the reason why this uh, research is often very limited is because oftentimes the solution for when a person is falling is to give a person a wheelchair. And they think that physicians, clinicians often think that if we just give this person a wheelchair, they're gonna stop falling um, and we don't have to worry about it anymore. Uh, but as the data shows us, uh, wheelchair users continue to fall despite the, the use of a wheelchair. Um, so therefore, uh, we need to get a better understanding. Um, so three things that we really need to look at. First, um, and what I'll be talking about for the, the rest of the time today, is a better understanding of the cause of falls. So why are people falling in the first place? Um, we also have to determine ways to accurately assess um, how not only fall frequency, but uh, factors associated with those falls, and then perform intervention studies so that we can have evidence-based um, protocols to follow um, to help people um, decrease their risk of falls. Um, so since uh, there was limited research out there, my research team and I thought that we should just start at the very beginning and perform a systematic review to see really uh, get an accurate picture of what data was available. Um, so to perform this systematic review, we pr uh, followed the PRISMA guidelines on how to perform a systematic review. Uh, we had three reviewers, uh, two PhDs um, in rehabilitation science, um, and then one master's student who provided assistance to us. Uh, the major keywords that we searched were accidental falls and wheelchairs, and then depending on the database, we had some secondary terms such as uh, not ambulatory, not walking, postural co control, and postural balance. Um, the studies that we looked at were all peer-reviewed and published in English, and they assessed fall-related characteristics in non-ambulatory individuals. Um, so we had, how we defined this was an individual who uses a wheeled mobility device um, in their, both in their living environment and their community as well. Um, so somebody who's using uh, some site, sort of wheelchair um, full-time. Also, to make sure that we are being as inclusive as possible, we did include studies that, ha that reported on mixed populations of people, uh, those who were both wheelchair users and non-wheelchair users, 
um, but we only looked at the data if it specifically um, talked about the wheelchair users separately. Um, uh, so just a little information about the papers that we collected. Um, we started off with over uh, 200 papers, um, but then as we screened those papers and then uh, looked at the full text, um, we came down actually to about 21 papers um, that really met all of our inclusion criteria. Um, so as I mentioned, the systematic review actually covered a variety of different topics, um, but for the rest of the time, I'm just going to be focusing on those risk factors associated with falls. Um, so we actually only found 11 papers that really looked at uh, these risk factors. Um, so we extracted those risk factors from the paper and categorized them. And the major categories that we came up with um, from the themes of the paper um, were wheelchair design and related uh, characteristics, uh, performance of transfers, uh, impaired balance, and then environmental factors associated with wheelchair use. So I'm gonna go through these different themes that we pulled out from these papers and discuss them a little bit further. Um, so first of all, um, wheelchair design and related characteristics. Um, so when we looked at these papers, um, kind of some sub-themes that appeared from it was first of all the fact that um, wheelchair maintenance was found to be a big factor associated with falls with the actual wheelchair itself. Um, three of the papers um, found that the cause of the fall associated with the wheelchair was uh, either because the chair was in a state of disrepair or it um, required some maintenance to be done. Um, and then the other papers um, looked at a variety of different, more specific characteristics related to the wheelchair, uh, such as uh, having an adjustable axle position, caster characteristics, um, the wheelbase itself, and so on. Um, and then moving into transfers, um, the majority of these papers that were looking at transfers um, just looked at the different activities that were um, occurring and um, found that transfers were a high percentage uh, um, associated with the falls that occurred. Um, so you can see we have a variety of different numbers. So this paper from Dreyer in 1994 found that 71% um, of falls occurred during transfers um, but versus the Nelson paper in 2003. Um, this could be um, impacted though by the participants that were evaluated. In the Dreyer paper, participants were still in an inpatient facility uh, versus Nelson were out in the community. So I think the people in Nelson were doing a lot of different activities, so that's why falls weren't um, as high of a percent, but they were still the top um, cause of, um, still the top activity performed when the fall occurred in both of those papers. Um, and then moving on to the balance papers, um, a major theme that came out um, from these was the idea of a person reaching out of their base of support. Um, so a person trying to balance themselves and reach for something um, away from their body. Um, we also found that having, in, um, obviously a little bit obvious, um, having intact seating balance was productive for falls. Um, and also it, it was a high self-perceived reason for falls as well. Um, and then finally, looking at the environmental factors, um, the major sub-theme that came out of this group of papers was either propulsion or driving a chair over rough surfaces outside. Um, unfortunately, the majority of these papers that we found were looking at manual wheelchair users, so we didn't have as much data on power wheelchair users, um, but looking at that, those rough surfaces and um, dry, propelling the chair over difficult terrain uh, was the major theme. Um, so just for a, a few discussion points about this um, research that we found, um, so there are a lot of risk factors out there, um, but the good news is that many of these factors are modifiable. Um, so we can make a difference and we can improve um, fall frequency. Um, one thing I didn't get to tell you, um, in the systematic review, we also looked at intervention studies that were conducted uh, to look at ways to manage fall risk. Um, and we actually only found one study uh, that was performed that was actually an intervention that we could base our um, treatment protocols on. 
So because we don't have a lot of intervention studies to go to, we have to make sure as clinicians that we understand these risk factors that are associated with falls. Um, so some of the things that we can do uh, based on this uh, information that we've found. Um, first of all, um, really emphasize proper wheelchair maintenance in the clinic. Even if we spend an extra five minutes talking to our patients about making sure that their chair is in good working order, or maybe we can even, if we have a large facility, set up a time where wheelchair users can come back and have vendors or whomever look over their chairs to make sure that they're in uh, proper working order. Um, making sure that people are getting appropriate transfer training. Um, in a lot of uh, populations with some degenerative disabilities, we actually are finding that people aren't getting transfer training and they really don't know what they're doing. They're just kind of picking it up from their friends. Uh, so if we're seeing a client in a wheelchair seating clinic and they're having trouble transferring, maybe refer them out to somebody who could spend the time to work on uh, transfer training. Also looking at the different pros and cons of um, wheelchair selection. Um, so when we are providing a chair to a person, um, it's always that difficult balance that we're trying to, um, to get to, um, providing the most appropriate chair, but making sure that it's fit all their needs. Uh, so one thing we found was that lighter weight chairs are associated with falls. Now I'm certainly not gonna tell you, you know, give everybody a heavy chair so they don't fall. It's very, very important for their upper extremities to have an ultralight chair, particularly for, for manual wheelchair users. Um, so those are two different things that we have to keep in our mind. And so if we do prescribe um, an ultralight chair, maybe just taking an extra minute to talk to the person about having a higher fall risk. Same thing with the adjustable axle position. And then maybe looking at different caster selections. Also talking to patients about um, their, their reaching limits, if they're trying to reach for things, understanding where their limits are, where they can safely reach. Um, also discussing the impact of hanging backpacks and other items on um, the back of manual chairs. If that's the only per way the person can transport their items, so be it, but we need to make sure that they're aware of these risk factors that exist. And then finally, making sure that people are getting the proper wheelchair skills training they need as well, both manual and power. A lot of times we think about manual only, but power is important too. Um, so just in conclusion, um, a lot of these things are modifiable, um, but we need to do more work. We only have very small studies, um, so we need to further look at these different factors. Also, there's a lot of factors that weren't fully examined in these papers. Um, things like cognition or extent of disability, we can borrow from other populations, um, and we see that they can impact it, so we need to look at that in wheelchair users. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to point out, I am doing a more comprehensive study looking at wheelchair users and fall risk. Um, so if you're interested in this topic and you have access to a large uh, group of wheelchair users, um, please feel free to contact me. Um, I'd be happy to send you the link to this survey. It only takes about 20 minutes. Um, so I'm running out of time. <laughs> I just want to thank my co-authors, uh, Jacob Sosnoff and Shreda Owsley. Thank you. Again, we have a little moment for questions while the presentation screens are being moved over to them. just sort of accept it as part of life and uh -huh. they don't think it's a really big deal and they forget to mention it to you and so it's it's always like sort of this hidden after fact that you find out later you know so I'm right. sure that that's that's helpful to study it because it happens more than you know yeah thank you yeah it, it does <coughs> thank you can I ask a question yeah. <laughs> thanks uh -huh. thanks very much can I, I was gonna ask a question this is sort of funny up here um, but yeah, I was just thinking in terms of, you know, the s studies you looked at were associative, mm -hmm. so they weren't causal. Right. And so when you say, you know, lighter weight cha wheelchairs might have caused the falls, I'm just curious, <coughs> you know, perhaps it's more the fact that people who have lighter weight cha wheelchairs are more active. And so it's not the right. chair, it's something else. Right, yeah, and you know, 
this is certainly a huge limitation with the studies that I looked at. They were all very small, just looking at association. So we really need to have you know more in-depth studies that we can really find you know these different factors that are associated with falls, such as being more active. If you're you know going out more, doing more things, sure you're more likely to fall. So yeah, that's definitely an area that we would need to look into further. Just one of the studies, and again, small study, um, found that people who transfer independently were at higher risk for falling um, versus having an assistant um, transfer them. But again, it's just one, you know, one study and, and smaller and so on. So we still have a lot of work to do. Hello, everyone. Um, anyway, so my name's uh, Ben Mortensen. I'm an assistant professor at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver where the ISS will be held next year. And I totally welcome you to go and attend. It's a beautiful place to be. Uh, very different than the uh, Gaylord Hotel. Our beauty is outside, not inside. So uh, just something to think about. Uh, so just a, a little bit of a, a, what do they call those, a caveat. I'm the third author on this paper, uh, but I'm the only one at the conference, so I got to be the presenter. So don't shoot the messenger, maybe what I would say. Um, anyway. So today I'm just going to tell you a little bit about some research we did looking at demographic factors that predict belt mobility in wheelchair users. And I'll explain to you what all that means in a few secs. So I have old stats in my slides. So this is sort of fun to see all the new stats coming out because it sounds like there's a 100 million people who need wheelchairs right now. And as we just heard, it's actually probably closer to 3 million Americans who use wheelchairs. So that in about 15 years, the number has doubled which is quite exciting, really. Uh, and then this is an old Canadian stat as well, saying there's 150,000 Canadians. Now, when you think about wheelchairs and, you know, uh, the ICF is one of the things that's been brought up as a way of looking at wheelchair use and, and understanding it a little more. And uh, Emma Smith, who's at the conference here, did a nice review looking at uh, factors that influence participation in, uh, in social and community activities for wheelchair users. A lot of the factors are not modifiable. You can't change someone's age and reverse their aging. But a lot of the factors are modifiable, as uh, uh, Dr. Rice was saying. So things around the wheelchair, uh, accessibility, skills, uh, you can adjust, you can try and uh, address pain. Uh, perhaps you can improve people's finances and, and education and things. Um, but as this little picture illustrates, a lot of the things that people encounter, we just take for granted as people who are able to walk around. And as a wheelchair user, you encounter things that may not um, be as simple. So why, hello? Did, I, did we lose me? No, okay. Uh, so the question, one of the questions is why would you want to quantify wheeled mobility? And I think there's a lot of really good reasons for doing that. Obviously, if you can understand the physical demands of wheeling, that is probably very important when you're thinking about the overuse injuries that many wheelchair users experience over time. Uh, you also might be able to use it as a way of understanding some of the environmental factors and how they influence wheelchair users. And therefore, you could explore some of the barriers and facilitators they experience. And obviously, if we could promote people's activity, uh, you know, physical activity is great, obviously, um, but also just activity in general would be really helpful as well. So, uh, you know, we've been measuring mobility for a long time. Uh, you know, it used to be just little counters. It used to measure how, how many times the wheel went around. And if you use your math, right, pi is equal to, uh, or diameter is equal to pi times uh, pi, pi times diameter. So you can figure out the circumference and figure out the distance people go. And so that's quite interesting. Uh, we're also doing more things now uh, with, you know, new technology, so we can do things like measure uh, whether people are actually in the chair or not, because sometimes, you know, if you're in a facility, people move the chair around when the resident's not in the chair. Uh, doesn't, sometimes if someone has a cat on the chair, that doesn't work as well, but if they don't have a cat in the chair, it's fine. Uh, we also use accelerometers, so if you put an accelerometer on the wheel, you get a sense of what's happening in uh, three planes, but mostly we're just interested in the vertical plane, so you can get a sense of what's happening with that wheel over time. And when you do that, you can start to get a little more nuanced understanding of people's mobility. So it's not just how, many, how far they went, because that's interesting, 
but you know, over the course of the day, so they went a certain distance. That really doesn't tell you what actually happened during the day, because maybe they did uh, a really long wheel. So they went for like a two, two kilometer wheel, and that's all they did. Well, that's very different than if they went two kilometers, but they did uh, 200 times stopping and starting to do that. Because you think about all those inertial forces on people's shoulders, the inertial force is really starting and stopping. It's, you know, once you've hit, reached the steady state, it's a very different forces on the shoulder. So uh, that's, I think, one of the reasons that we started to look more at bouts. So what is actually sort of happening on a more micro level? So uh, these are just some interesting things. So uh, Sonnenblum and uh, Steven Spriggle found that uh, basically people's mean uh, do about 90 bouts a day. Uh, I think, did I define the bout yet? Uh, we'll come, I think we'll define bout in a second. Uh, maybe I'll go ahead and do it now. Uh, yeah, so about uh, from Stoneburn and Spriggle, about is uh, lasts about five seconds and has a gr speed greater than or equal to 0.12 meters per second and ends when someone's gone less than 0.76 meters in 15 seconds. So that's their operational definition of about. And when they use that definition, they find that wheelchair users do about 90 bouts a day. So not as much as you might think, but I mean, when we think about us, as people, we probably don't do much either in a way. You know, you go to, you drive to work, you walk into your desk, you sit down at your desk, and you might not move for, you know, two or three hours unless you're running to get coffee. Um, and so, you know, I'm not sh convinced that there, the differences are as big as you might think between people who ambulate and people who wheel in terms of what they're doing. Um, and, th and then in terms of the mean bout, people are going about 20 meters, the bouts are about 36 seconds long, and about half a meter a second. And, but in terms of the median bout, you'll see why, you're, why this is important. They're only about 8.6 meters, 21 seconds, and about a little slower, to be honest. So when you look at distances people go, uh, they range, obviously. Uh, we've got some, quite a few US studies here where they're showing people are ranging in between one and a half and to two and a half mile, or kilometers. Uh, which I won't translate into miles because I wouldn't, I'd be hopeless at that. Uh, and then in terms of amount of time wheeling, you're looking at less than an hour a day in the studies that captured that. Uh, interestingly, when you look at speeds, the speeds tend to be higher in those studies that just look at overall uh, distance. So this shows you why we think about median versus uh, mean bouts. Uh, because when you look at these little graphs, you see there's a lot of data that's really far off to the right. So the data is skewed. So that's why when you do a mean, your mean tends to shift into the middle more. Whereas if you do a median, which is the middle value, you'll tend to shift, you'll, I think you represent more than normal what people are doing. And you can see here uh, with some other research from uh, Sharon Schoenenberg, uh, about mean bouts are about 20 meters long, 36 seconds. So I think we talked about that. So for our research, what we were doing is we wanted to look at, uh, we had some demographic variables and we were borrowing data from uh, Steven Spriggle and Sharon Sonnenblum. And we wanted to look at what were the areas that predicted the median bout characteristics. So we were interested in their median distance, the median duration, and the median speed. So going on right into the results, uh, basically we had a sample of a 70 wheelchair users uh, most of them were male, 52 of them. Uh, average age was around 40, uh, with a range of 18 to 67. And the range of wheeling experience was about 14 years. Quite a bit of range, once again, from one and a half to 41 years. And with those 70 people, that we collected about, there were collected bout data on, there were 60,000 bouts collectively over that course. So it's big data that we're looking at. And when you look at how far they went, et cetera, so the median distance was about 8.1 meters, median duration 20 seconds, and median velocity was about 0.4 meters per second, which is basically the same as all the other studies so far. So not a lot of differences there. So what we did was we um, used a multiple regression analysis. So we basically entered in these variables into a model to try and figure out which ones were the independent predictors of those outcomes. So we had data on people's age, their gender, their occupation, uh, whether they were able to ambulate uh, at least two steps and the years of wheeling experience. 
And when we entered all that information to him, uh, basically the big things were occupation outside the home and ability to ambulate. And so people who had an occupation outside the home and could ambulate at least two steps uh, went further per bout, and that explained about 36% of the variance. They had longer bouts, about 27% of the variance, and they did faster bouts, which makes sense if you go faster or longer. Uh, so, you know, it's interesting, well, why uh, would these two factors be predictors? And this is where, we, you know, we don't, it's not a causal study, it's just a cross-sectional, so we just tried to kind of think of why that might be. And our thoughts were, well, people who ambulate probably have higher functional ability, uh, and they might be able to better handle inaccessible situations so they don't get stopped, so then they can keep going and keep having more bouts. And, and potentially, as a, they could actually maybe conserve energy too, because for them to transfer, they probably stand to transfer, whereas people who are transferring using their arms, that might add to the fatigue factor that they experience, so that might decrease their, uh, the bouts they do. And then in terms of occupation, I think it's obvious that if you're uh, doing things outside the home, you're probably required to do more bouts. Uh, and then there's all these things that when you're doing an occupation that um, probably require you to do more bouts. Like you have to go get your Starbucks because that's what we do, right? Uh, well, at least if you're in Vancouver. Um, and then the other issue is just in terms of you probably need to go outside more. And if you're going outside more, that probably contributes to bouts as well. And I think this, there's previous research that is supportive of this idea in that uh, people, well, uh, Tolerico, I don't know if I'm saying that right, uh, their study, they found that people who were employed went farther and longer, and they had a, a far, farther average maximum distance between consecutive stops. And Oyster et al. found that people who were employed went farther, faster, and longer as well. So, you know, I guess the big question is, so what? It, you know, what are bouts, what do they mean, and is it really important? Um, well, it, you know, it's interesting. If you're thinking in terms of occupation, a lot of people who use wheelchairs are not employed. And so being employed would be great for most people who use wheelchairs. So perhaps it's the other way around, that if we can get people to be employed, we'll actually increase their bouts more, which, and that, to me, would be a great outcome. Um, however, when we, th as I mentioned earlier, when you think about bouts, those initial stopping and starting forces are actually quite a bit of uh, force and might contribute to more overuse injuries. So those, then we might be thinking, well, these are the people we might want to target to try and decrease those uh, potential problems. So, I mean, they've got the row wheels downstairs, which are so cool, trying to reduce the forces. There's a lot of add-ons that people are using, so maybe that's a good way to go. So I, I think there's some interesting thoughts in terms of interventions down the road that way. And then we just have questions about, you know, what's the relationship between median bout and overall level of physical activity? So right now we're actually continuing the work of, of uh, Steven Spriggle. Yeah, in Vancouver, we're doing a replication study. So we're exploring the relationship between wheelchair activity and community participation to try and further elucidate this idea. And looking at, again at some demographic variables that pr will predict wheelchair activity. So just to wrap it up, uh, obviously I wanna really thank Dr. Uh, Spriggle, who you heard this morning, and Sharon Sonnenblum uh, for their letting us have the data and for, you know, it's been really fun to uh, collaborate with them over the last few years. And obviously big thanks to everyone here. And if you have questions about the methodology, you could definitely contact uh, Sharon at the uh, email address there, or you could contact me or something like that. I'll transition over to Michael, questions? Seven second rule. Oh, that was a stretch, right? <laughs> I thank you very much. Okay.
So I know this is breaking the rules, but while the gentleman fixes the system, I will already give you the code since we're running slightly behind so you get out of here on time. Please don't tell anybody that I broke the rules. Your CEU code for this session is PS1220. One more time. PS1220. Right, I might change that code sequence until after the last paper. Emily Lowndes, and this is Michael Banks, and we looked at using the smart wheel to assess push force with different size casters, forks, and placement of the center of mass. And we're just going to keep rolling until they are able to get, uh, oh, almost. All right, perfect. So why is this important? As the wheelchair industry has developed, the history of the manual wheelchair has become where it has multiple adjustments and various components. We know that being able to provide optimal mobility with a proper setup and properly using all of these adjustments and components is critical in being able to reduce those biomechanical injuries and the overuse uh, that tends to occur with longtime users. So the goal of having these variations is really to provide the proper setup and a decrease the potential for injuries. So as we began to look into some of the literature that was available, we wanted to try and find pieces that really looked directly at the user and push force requirements. Uh, there wasn't very much literature out there, if any at all, that really supported this. So we went back to try and figure out which forces uh, were really most affected with the change in these variables. And looking at those variables, we found that the caster's uh, fork size and placement of the center of mass was most important. So just uh, gleaning from a couple pieces of these pieces of literature, Frank et al. looked at rolling resistance across three flooring surfaces with uh, variations in the tires. Some of the parameters that they looked at included the turning resistance, rolling resistance, and the step climbing force. And what they found was that there was very little correlation between the rolling resistance and these wheel parameters. Uh, the greatest turning resistance across all of the surfaces did occur with the largest wheel uh, diameter. Uh, Tomlinson looked at maneuverability and stability in adjustable wheelchairs and its impact on rolling resistance. He looked at the overall length of the wheelchair the distance horizontally between the axle and uh, the center of mass, the placement uh, both anterior and posterior horizontally with the uh, center of mass. And his findings were that just the inverse relationship of the rolling resistance and the weight placed on the rear wheels. So as more, we more weight is placed posteriorly, there is a decrease in the rolling resistance. Uh, he did find, though, that the effects of stability is much larger than the effects of maneuverability. So that's just something else to kind of keep in mind as we progress forward. And then Suarez et al. Uh, looked at deceleration rates and rolling resistance uh, with three different casters, four different rear wheels, and different weight distributions. And again, they, they found the same with the inverse relationship as far as rolling resistance and uh, mobility is concerned. They did see that the rolling resistance was significantly larger with that anterior placement of weight on the casters uh, versus the rear wheels. So what does this mean for the user? Uh, what are the direct correlations that some of these studies and these changes in components have on the everyday user? Uh, well, not many of the studies out there look directly at the user. Most of them tend to look at just the wheelchair and the direct environment. And so we wanted to be able to try and ameliorate this and, and decrease that gap and begin to shift to looking to the user. What quantifiable measures are out there do we have to support the user's effort? 
not very many. And then what are the correlations to everyday situations? A lot of the studies looked at using a treadmill, some sort of mechanical system or device to slow the chair or provide the turning, uh, but didn't really, again, take into impact to the user. Uh, so when we began to look at how we wanted to develop this study, we wanted to incorporate turning and uh, going over carpet and, and some of those, those aspects that users face on a daily basis. So the purpose of this study really is to address the effects of different size casters, forks, and placement of the center of mass with a force exerted by the user. And in doing so, we decided to use the smart wheel. So as Emily said, what we were particularly interested in is the, the force that the user would have to overcome to maneuver through a course on commercial low pile carpet for a typical work situation for an individual. Um, so we were able to manipulate these three factors, caster size, fork length, and center of mass. And here's just some anecdotes that um, we are used to seeing within our industry. Some of these have been borne out by measurements in the laboratory. Some of them are, are still kind of anecdotal. Some of them have been proven indirectly. Um, this is our, basically our experimental design where we took four inch casters with short forks, four inch casters with long forks, six inch casters with short forks, six inch casters with long forks, and then manipulated whether the wheelchair was front loaded or rear loaded. This is just give you a visual of the difference between uh, these two frog legs casters, a six inch and a four inch caster with a elastomeric tire, same tire profile. <clears throat> this is our apparatus for changing the center of ma mass in the wheelchair. That's a, uh, a tractor weight. That's a contour, pin dot contour U pan and some uh, shipping straps from a power wheelchair that we used. We were able to um, change the distribution of weight on the wheelchair forks. 40, the front loaded situation where we moved the, wheel, the weight forward, we just had two positions, front and rear. Moved it forward, we were weighting about 45% of the total mass on the casters. Moved it to the rear, that changed it to 26% of the mass on the casters. We were hoping that, that we would have the necessary sensitivity and resolution with a uh, precision instrument in the smart wheel. It's just a, a vector diagram of, of the kinds of forces that, uh, that are measured with the smart wheel. We're measuring force in the X, Y, Z axis as well as rotational force or moment. moment. There's a picture of our course that we used with the, basically a combination of the smart wheel protocols that use a figure eight. These are spaced out, there's a specific distance from each other. The difference is that we did this on carpet. So our protocol was a little bit different than the standard protocol that the smart wheel has. But these are things that we wanted to answer for ourselves. And in fact, um, interestingly, we found that the fork length, we could not resolve a significant difference in the force that it took to maneuver through the course based on fork length. However, caster diameter and center of mass <clears throat> were highly significant, different. Um, and that's consistent with what other users have found uh, six inch casters require more force to turn through this figure eight course than a four inch caster. And uh, again, a four inch caster requires less force, but a front loaded four inch caster requires a lot more force than a rear loaded front caster. <clears throat> um, we also found that there was a significant inter 
significant interaction effect that apparently front-loading the casters affects a six-inch caster much more than a four-inch caster. And uh, trying to come up with a reason for that, we feel that that's probably due to, um, as what other researchers have identified as scrubbing, for example, the um, paper Caspel, uh, Seligson, Dow, and Spriegel, 2013. Caster scrubbing is, a, is an important thing. When you're trying to move a particular size caster wheel in a sharper turn than it wants to go, you get this scrubbing effect, and that's, of course, going to increase force proportionally. It's just a graphical representation of our results showing the, the front loaded in blue, the rear loaded in red, and the fact that it's quite a lot less force. I'll turn this back to you. So in conclusion, what does this really mean? Uh, we found that there was no significant difference using variations in the fork size. Some say that with the larger fork, you get the little bit longer fork trail, and this can decrease the shimmy as some of the literature out there supports. But for us, because we were using the figure eight protocol uh, over carpet, we really didn't see this effect, and, and therefore kind of took out the, the fork as, as having that really nice positive impact that we were looking for. But what we did find was that the posterior center of mass placement, while using the four inch casters, required the least amount of force by the user with the propulsion over our study design uh, course. But it's important to note that while this requires the least amount of force, this specific setup using smaller casters may not be the answer for everybody. If you have very active individuals who spend a lot of time outside or crossing various terrain over thresholds and this, that, and the other, it's important that you also look into the consideration of using those larger casters just to help uh, perform that mobility maximally independent. Overall, the optimal configuration should be individualized to the user with the support from the interdisciplinary team. Uh, we want input from the users, therapists, ATPs, engineers, everybody to be hands-on and, and on board to really optimize the proper configuration for the user. Whether the user is an active individual or sedentary, even these small changes can make a difference over a lifetime of use, which I think is something that we just really wanted to try and quantify uh, with our study. Also, it's um, a great tool to use. The Smart Wheel was able to give us those measurements that we were looking for uh, that really directly related to the user and not just the wheelchair and the components that were involved. I want to thank the, the following entities and individuals for the time they spent to help us out with the project. We we're not affiliated with a manufacturer. We just did this because we we're interested in it. We wanted to see what we could learn. Are any questions? Do you find that this has changed your recommendations, like with new users? I mean, you, I find that a lot of times people that are on their second, third, or fourth choice of chairs, they're very specific about what kind of caster size they like. But the new users, they almost leave it up to you sometimes. And I wondered if you take them through all the different, has this affected your, your approach, I guess? I'll speak to that a little bit. I'm a physical therapist, and so going through when I'm doing the wheelchair evaluations and talking with the clientele who is looking at their new chairs, I do address this, and I have used our data and, and this information and some of these key research pieces to say, okay, so I want you to think about this as far as outdoor use, but then also, you know, depending on what your everyday activities, what are you doing most? You know, from that study, let's look at really choosing front casters. And I believe one of the authors had also mentioned the importance of choosing the front casters over the, the rear wheels just because of its significant impact on mobility. So. I appreciate the study. Uh, Theoretically, the six inch caster should have less rolling resistance than the four inch caster on a straight run. So depending how long you choose your figure eight course will probably change that number, is that correct? If you had a longer figure eight course, you may find that the six inch caster performed better. Yeah, we, uh, we understand that the physics of... Go to the oh. microphone there, please. Wheel diameter 
and the relationship between rolling resistance and wheel diameter. Um, there was, we feel that it's because of the, the, the nature of the turn, there's so much more force involved in the user pulling with one, pushing with the other hand rim to negotiate these tight turns. And I think you're right. I think you would, you would find less if the, if the circuit was increased in size. You would, you'd have softer turns. You would expect it to get it to a point where uh, that would be the case. But all of the work that we've seen uh, that would support lower rolling resistance for a larger diameter has been, like you said, it's been straight, straight. tracks. Can you just explain caster scrubbing? Explain caster explain scrubbing. Explain caster scrubbing? Yeah. <laughs> I'll try, okay. Uh, so, you have, I have a contact patch with a wheel, the material that's in contact with the surface. When you have uh, four, four wheels on it, basically a parallelogram, you have all four wheels in contact with a surface, and you're turning this rectangular shape through a turn uh, based on the diameter of the wheel that the wheels will want to prescribe a certain curvature of turn. If you force the, di the because of the diameter of the wheel is larger, it's going to want to subtend a, a wider arc. Uh, it's going to require more input force from the user to make that a tighter turn. So the scrubbing, as I understand it, is literally you're causing that caster to move laterally on the surface to force a tighter turn that it wants to make. Any other questions? This, uh, the smart wheel produces a, uh, a, gener a standard report that you can utilize. What we decided to do was use the raw data, and it turned out to be thousands and thousands of numbers. I mean, it was it was incredible. In fact, you know, we had to upgrade computers and software to be able to deal with the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of values that were produced by SmartWheel. It was it was exciting. So we enjoyed ourselves. Thank you both. Thank you. And you already know the code. <laughs>